uh, Apache JVAC languages um, toolkit. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, and thank you for all coming out on what appears to be maybe the hottest day uh, ever. I know it's it's very hot. Um, yes, I'm, I'm Patrick Burns. Uh, I'm a researcher at uh, the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World, uh, which um, is, uh, an, is, an, is an ancient world institute in New York City, which has a very wide, um, both chronological and geographic basis, um, really, I'd say, a Portugal to China, a Bronze Age to um, uh, medieval range. Uh, and the reason I mention that now is because what I'll be talking about today will specifically be, uh, as we see here, um, uh, I'll be talking about ancient Greek with the classical language toolkit, but one of the, the broader takeaways I want from this talk is that uh, ancient Greek is only one part of the mission of, of the CLTK, as I'm going to call it through the, through the talk, uh, that um, all of these things, no matter what uh, historical language you're working on, there's going to be something for you here today. Uh, and so I'm going to get started. Uh, maybe I'll also, yes, not yet. I'm still talking widely. I'm showing them this. One. So uh, I, I thought it would be a good idea because um, uh, my, my talk will be both broad at times and, and somewhat technical at times to get some temp temperatures. You so rarely hear that in the plural uh, uh, of the room on things. So um, well, so who 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 studies ancient Greek in the room? Okay, so like about five out of, five out of 20, that's good. Uh, Latin, and while we're on the, his, uh, some other uh, historical language, fantastic. Yes, I, you, can, you can be proud of that moment, okay. Um, who here uh, is a, does any computer programming? Uh, all right, so that's, okay, so that, this is my audience here, that's fantastic. Uh, basically, right at this point in my career, I'm a computer programmer devoted to the study of uh, historical languages, so that's where we are. Uh, and Python as a programming language, uh, is that, that's, that's pretty popular, that's, that's where we're at these days, great. Um, so in, in this title is, is either obscure or transparent, depending on who you are. Uh, lemmatization, is that a word that people are gonna, gonna know off the bat? Just what we're talking about there is if I were to give you a word, we wanna determine what word you'd go to in the dictionary to, to look it up. So we wanna be able to retrieve those as automatically as possible. Uh, ancient Greek we're comfortable with. Classical language toolkit I'll get to in a second. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share these slides now. So I'm gonna, one I'm gonna prove. I have to. This one. Yeah. Uh, okay. And share my slides. Share the entire screen. We think we're good. Fantastic. Okay. So yes, backlog limitization for ancient Greek with the classical language toolkit. Okay. And so I've also made these slides available online if anyone uh, wants to follow. You don't, you don't need to follow on today, but you might want to return to them as I'll go through a lot of material somewhat fast. Uh, we have limited time. Um, but uh, yeah, you can maybe take a photo or something. We can write this down later. Okay, so let me just give you some background on uh, uh, both myself and the project. One, I have a degree, I'm a PhD in classics. I, I studied Latin literature. I have a degree at, uh, from Fordham University. Um, I, I worked on Lucan, I mean, temperature of the rooms. Anyone read Lucan besides me? No, okay. Uh, fantastic, we have a Lucan uh, crowd. Uh, and so I got involved in thinking about genre in Lucan during my uh, research. And increasingly I thought to myself, oh, it'd be great to have some ways of doing some computational work on Lucan, and the tools weren't quite available for Latin at the time. So this is an iterative process by which I wanted to study Lucan, but the tools weren't there. So I started developing the tools, which then I apply to Lucan, and I find out they still didn't work so well. So you go back to develop, you know, so it was like waterfall up kind of uh, thing. And I got involved uh, with a project called uh, the Classical Language Toolkit from a fairly early time in its development. And with the Classical Language Toolkit, uh, is doing is we, we want to we want to have uh, an open source platform for doing uh, text analysis work and natural language processing work on historical languages and we have a fairly large scope uh, like like the place where I work I said I saw has this very large uh, geographic and chronological uh, basis so does the CLTK I mean uh, the, even here the, the the languages of ancient classical and medieval Eurasia I mean that's just an enormous right so we have a very wide scope. Um, 
And we're developing things like tokenizers, the, abil the ability to break texts into smaller pieces, whether those are sentences or phrases, words are, are the most common way in which we tokenize things. Uh, I suppose I could tokenize by letter if necessary. Uh, lemmatizers, that's what I'll be talking about today, where we have a word and we want to get the, uh, the dictionary head word. So an English example, uh, something very easy, perhaps like the word go. We've, if we have go on the page, we're going to want to look up go in the dictionary. Maybe a harder problem be went. We also want to be able to get go from searching for went. Okay. Uh, part of speech taggers, we want to be able to tell on an automated basis whether something is a noun or a verb, adjective, et cetera. This turns out to be very helpful in, uh, in doing many text analysis tasks. All sorts of morphology, et cetera. Right now, Latin is definitely the furthest ahead in development, but I've been spending a lot of time recently on ancient Greek. That's what I'll be talking about today. And right now we have projects going on doing uh, old, old Germanic, uh, some cuneiform uh, language support. Uh, and uh, and the, the number of languages that we're supporting increases uh, as the uh, the user base and contributor base increases. Again, uh, we, uh, we can go to github.com slash CLTK is where we keep the code for the project. Uh, it was founded by uh, Kyle Johnson, an NYU uh, PhD in classics as well. Uh, and this is someone who's been a wonderful collaborator, good help to me. We have a team of academic advisors you can see there. We also do some front end development. I won't be talking about that today, but uh, just so you see Luke Hollis is working on that. Okay, so what are the goals of the Classical Language Toolkit? Well, the first thing we wanna do is make sure that we have text available. If we don't have text, we can't have text analysis, right? So we wanna make sure that we have uh, uh, corpora that can be processed, again, for that full range of historical languages. Much more interesting as the work continues, as the language support increases, we want to be able to start generating, collecting linguistic data. Uh, we, we're aiming for a quantified classics. Uh, we want to have those sorts of text analysis tools, uh, natural language processing tools that are readily available for modern languages, especially English, uh, uh, Mandarin, Arabic increasingly. Uh, th those are, don't tend to be as readily available for historical languages, although Greek and Latin, again, have some pretty good historical support. Uh, but we're trying to increase that, build models, build tools. And lastly, uh, this is sort of the dream, this, this is the high goal. We want to have a framework for integrated studies of the ancient world and what I'm calling a next generation comparative philology. We really want to be able to think about the ancient world and its language systems in uh, a, uh, a productive, uh, co collaborative way. Uh, and uh, I'm just doing, I'm expressing those sorts of sentiments through uh, coding. All right, the project's about four years old. I love this slide uh, because every time I get to show it, the numbers creep up just a little bit. We have a little bit, just a few more people using the project, a few more people collaborating on the project. Uh, the one thing I'll point out here, uh, uh, well, two things. One, uh, 63 people working on 20 teams, that's pretty good. And the reason we have 20 teams for what's relatively a small project in the open source community is because you wind up having to have actually pretty good language specific uh, uh, research interests, right? Uh, I can work on the Latin and Greek tools with high confidence, but we have people working on Sanskrit. We have people working on the cuneiform languages. It requires an enormous amount of domain knowledge that you might not see in other open source projects. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to point out uh, we have uh, and have had for the last, uh, uh, this will be the third year, we're a Google Summer of Code participating organization. Uh, this year we're, we're sponsoring three projects. Uh, and the where my work in automated lemmatization uh, for ancient languages started was with the 2016 Google Summer of Code uh, project. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Or I guess now, this is my next slide. Uh, you'll see that I did a back off uh, Latin lemmatizer uh, in 2016. Uh, this was uh, something that was based on the natural language toolkit uh, back off tagging. And I'll explain back off tagging uh, in, in one second. Uh, but basically, I can summarize it by saying what we want to have is when we think about a, a, a tool, we tend to think about uh, one thing. Uh, I've broken it out so that this is a, uh, it's an ensemble of tools that get used as one. And what I mean by that is I don't I didn't just write one lemmatizer to look up the uh, dictionary entry for word. Uh, we have this chain uh, which. It tries to look it up in one lemmatizer, and if it doesn't work, it goes to the next one, and if it doesn't find it, it goes to the next one. And so I'll be talking about ensemble methods. Okay, uh, you can find more information at cltk.org, 
And also, I'm pretty uh, easily uh, found at, uh, on Twitter, uh, it's been too much of my time there, uh, at DIY Classics. So if any questions come up uh, and you need to get in touch with me at a later point, uh, feel free to contact me there uh, or uh, through the CLTK. Okay, so back to something I mentioned but didn't fully explain, what is back off tagging? Okay. So uh, again, I didn't know what the, the uh, uh, linguistics or the NLP uh, range uh, of the room was. So if, if we have an English sentence like the apple is red, this is a fairly unambiguous sentence to uh, find the part of speech is for, right? Uh, there's not a lot of ambiguity in, in the word forms here, right? All of these can basically be taken to uh, be the core form that we have here. The is always a determiner, et cetera, okay? This sentence in English is more problematic, though not terribly so, but here's, here's what happens. If you were to automate this process, right, pipe really uh, is almost always a noun, but it could be a verb. Uh, lead led's actually a real problem in disambiguation. Even in this sentence, it would be somewhat difficult. Um, but we have ways of approaching this problem uh, computationally, uh, or at least formally, that uh, will get us closer and closer to the solution. For example, I can use a what's called a bigram tagger. That's that is I'm going to use information from two words in uh, data that the computer has seen before, and we can learn with with pretty high confidence that a word that follows the is almost always in English going to be uh, an adjective or a noun. Okay, so uh, we can we can rule out that it's a verb, and that would be using a bigram tagger with uh, some part of speech information to eliminate ambiguity. Uh, lead led still a problem in this, but we have other methods, and I'll go through them uh, uh, as the talk continues. All right, so by grand tagger can give us noun with fairly good confidence. We don't really have an adjective pipe. Uh, uh, Latin, which I thought more people would know Latin. Actually, more people raised their hand for Greek. I, I thought I showed the Latin example. Uh, these sort of uh, uh, linguistic ambiguities occur in all languages, right? And so here we have amor, omnia, we, get, we have some good uh, ovid here. Uh, we all know that love conquers all, and it's a noun, love, the noun conquers all. Uh, but in fact, amor is an ambiguous form in Latin uh, where it could either be uh, the, uh, the, the noun for love, which by the way, it always is, uh, or it could be the first person singular present indicative passive of the verb amo, which it's, it's possible, but you're gonna have to read like 100, 200, 300 pages of Latin before you ever find that, okay? So we can uh, approach this with a, with a, 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 we can apply back off tagging as one solution for figuring out this sort of thing, right? And here's, uh, it's very small, I apologize, uh, but uh, here's an example of how back off tagging might work in the natural language toolkit. That's not my project, it's the project that uh, tends to be used for modern language. Uh, work in this area. Uh, and so we have uh, some, some base tagger, uh, some, some, it doesn't really do anything except it has what we call methods for applying a tag, but it doesn't have any rules for applying a tag. Okay, it's just a totally abstract concept. And also we want to be able to evaluate what we do. All right, and then we have a sequential back off tagger, which means uh, that's another abstract kind of tagger. And that's the one I'll be using uh, throughout this talk, which will allow us, um, it, it, one, it will choose the tag we want, but it'll also run a chain. It'll keep track of where we are and which back off tagger is being used at any given point. Uh, and then, for example, you can have a default tagger, a tagger that applies the same tag to every word. Uh, you can just you know, have a sentence and just say they're all nouns. You're gonna get like 25%. <laughs> the accuracy is gonna be uh, higher than you might think. Uh, it's not a particularly effective strategy, but we can do things like that. But we also have, uh, you'll see context tagger, n-gram tagger, u-gram tagger. This is an inheritance chain. Um, a context tagger will use the words around uh, a word that we provide to it in training data, okay? And an n-gram tagger will determine how many words you should use in context. And a unigram tagger will say, well, we actually only want a context of one, which means we just use the data that we have available from any word at a given time. But again, this will turn out to be valuable information for lemmatization. NLTK offers a, a number of back off taggers. Again, default assigns all the tokens to the same tag. Context gives us some uh, words before and after if necessary. Uh, we can also provide uh, a model. We can just say a one-to-one -one dictionary relationship between any word and a given tag. We could just say the is always gonna be a determiner. 
we can all, we can say something like odd in Latin is always going to be a preposition or soon is always going to be a preposition in Greek. Okay. Uh, we can use regular expressions to assign it. Re regular expressions, temperature of the room, this is something. All right, we're, we're good. Uh, and it turns out, depending on the language, uh, we can use regular expressions to, with, with good uh, effectiveness to find the endings of words or the beginnings of words, depending on the language, uh, to get information about uh, um, where its morphology it is. And so we'll, we can use all those. These are all already available in the NLTK. Uh, again, that's a more of a modern language uh, approach to this. The CLTK builds upon the functionality of the providing uh, historical language customizations for it. So what is back off limitization? Because I've been talking about POS tagging so far. POS tagging wasn't in the title of my talk. Uh, well, again, I had this, I was doing a lot of POS tagging uh, on my own, trying to figure out these things, using the NLTK to solve some problems. And then I thought to myself, what if I just apply the back off method to limitization? Uh, because lemmatization, after all, is a tagging task, right? We're just, we just have to find out what, if we have a form of a word, the lemma is a kind of tag. Uh, the difficulty is that it's an infinite task. And what I mean by this is that uh, there's really no limit to the number of words that exist in the world. <laughs> so uh, the thing, like, so if we look at the pen uh, um, uh, part of speech tag set has 36 tags. Okay, so for any given word uh, that exists in English, you only have a one in 36 chance of, uh, of you know, with, with lemmatization, you basically have a one over uh, infinity, right? So it, it's not exactly, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very difficult tagging task is where I'll leave it. But it doesn't mean that it's useless to think in these terms. Uh, for example, the idea of unigram tagging, right, of using information that we have from training data for what any one given word is can be very useful for lemmatization as well. And so here we go back to our sentence where amor only a vincit, right? Uh, I can use, I can suck in a whole bunch of uh, Latin that's already tagged. For example, I have the ancient Greek and Latin dependency tree bank uh, made by uh, uh, Giuseppe Cialano and the Perseus team, which already gives me uh, form information. Actually, I've made it bigger here. Form information is still small. Form and lemma, right? And I can use the unigram context to find out, well, I can count how many times amor is mapped as a, to the lemma amor, right? It turns out to be 34 times in some, uh, I think I have 9,000 sentences Latin that I can train on, right? Uh, and uh, amo uh, as the lemma for amor appears zero times in, in the nine sentences. This is an extreme example. Um, but we can use that unigram ta uh, uh, context to decide that really we want that to be tagged more often as the noun than the verb, okay? So this is using a unigram tagger to do a limitization task, right? And as I said, we have all the other taggers that are available already from uh, the Natural Language Toolkit that we can now adapt for limitization use for historical languages. Again, uh, regular expressions are a good way of doing this. I can create lists of uh, ending patterns for Latin, as it, and as it we'll see, I can do it for Greek as well, uh, to get um, even more information. So maybe I pass it over all the training data first, right? And uh, it, it tries to figure out the problem with, with just the training data. If, if it doesn't find a suitable lemma or tag, a lemma as tag, it can go to the next one. Maybe we start looking at regular expressions. If it doesn't find a regular expression, it can go, okay, and we can put together as many uh, as we want. So perhaps a unigram tagger with a dictionary would be a good place to start. Get some high frequency words tagged right away. Maybe then we go to training data, okay? It can loop through the data, well, uh, the, uh, the sentences we want uh, limitized uh, again, and maybe it finds a match, it can stop there. Maybe it doesn't find a match. We can go to a regular expression tagger at that point, point. and in fact, we can put together as many of these as possible. I've been thinking increasingly uh, uh, of this lemmatization back off chain, as we call it, uh, as um, uh, Legos. I have kids in the house, right? And they they like to put together the, you know, the, the Lego sets and um, they, they sometimes put them together in ways in which I wouldn't have thought to put them together. Well, that's, that's how research works, right? I have my research questions working on the, the Lucan or the Greek literature I want to work on, and I'm going to think of a certain way to assemble these taggers together, these lemmatizers, but you have a different research question. You work on a different language, all right? There's going to be different needs for different uh, people working with uh, these tools in the ancient world.
Okay. And again, it's kind of nice to put a default tagger at the end of, <laughs> of a backup chain. Often we'll just use unknown as the lemma. It's kind of helpful to know which ones weren't actually tagged by the chain. Uh, sometimes though, you really want to just boost your, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, your accuracy a little bit. I found that something I call uh, an identity tagger where it just gives you back the form as the lemma. It turns out to be it, a lot of words that don't appear frequently are used in the nominative, it turns out. So there you go, uh, little hints. Okay, so what I want to move to at this point is back off lemmatization uh, as a philological method, right? And so I, I don't want this to be entirely just about text analysis as a computational problem, because that's not how I was trained as a classicist, nor is that really how I approach literature or language in general. Uh, and what do I mean by a philological method? Uh, what I realized as I started to play with this, as I started to put together my Lego-like lemmatizers to solve this problem, was uh, even though I was doing it with code, I was still applying many of the techniques that I use when I say read ancient Greek, or I'm you know, trying to learn Hebrew, or and I'm still putting language together in very specific ways. Um, and what I mean by philological here is that uh, I want a project that reflects the reading, decoding, and disambiguating strategies of the trained philologist. And as it turns out, uh, I'll get back to the Pope in a second, uh, that um, especially when you're learning these languages, that chain I showed you earlier here is, is sort of how your mind works, right? You, there are some words you recognize right away and you're applying a mental dictionary to. There's some words in which you really need to use the words that are around it to figure out, and there are also cases where you just look for the ending Right? Or you just give up and you just apply a default, <laughs> a default lemma in your mind, right? It happens. Uh, so that's where we're at. So uh, again, uh, what would be a philological method? I thought to myself, uh, again, I, I thought Latin would be the way to go in, to introduce this problem. Um, this is a, po a po papal tweet on Pontifex LN uh, where he talked about care to minibus mundialibus spiromachiae. Uh, spiromachiae, uh, a round thing battle, will uh, not appear in, I guarantee you, will not appear in any training data available for Latin literature, and the equivalent probably doesn't appear in the Greek training data I could find either, uh, nor will it appear uh, in any lexicon that already exists for the language I'm working on here, right? That's a problem, except we can apply, again, a back off strategy, right? I look it up in my lexicon, it's not there, right? So maybe I go to endings next, I can actually say machiae, I know that that's gonna to resolve to spiro machia. I might not know what it means, but I know where to look it up in the dictionary. This is why a back off task seems to replicate my philological thinking in general. Okay, and again, lexicon at the end winds up looking quite a bit like that chain, okay? The lexicon is like a dictionary or lexicon limitizer. I like the regular expression limitizer, context is like the model. And I'm increasingly working this into what I've been calling object-oriented philology. And what I mean by that is, uh, again, we have this, this kind of chain idea, this inheritance idea. This, the, the classical language toolkit has a lemmatized module, right? And that's fairly abstract. It just has like what would work for lemmatization in general. But then, and so we have a dictionary lemmatizer at that level. We have a regular expression lemmatizer at that level. We have a train lemmatizer at that, at that level. But then, I can create sub-language uh, classes for those, right? Something that's Latin-specific, something that's Greek-specific, and I can override all those settings, and further down the inheritance chain, uh, I can have the same lemmatization idea put forward with the, the, the ideas that are needed for the specific endings that make you a philological reader of Latin or a philological reader of Greek. I mean, some of the tools are gonna work better in some of the language, uh, some language groups than others, but everyone's going to have some language customization that can be abstracted to be useful tools across the, the chain. Uh, and this is that comparative philological model I've been working with. Why a back off approach? Flexibility and construction. This is the Lego idea. I can put them together as needed for a research question. Most out of the box limit, limitizers that are available are very good. They may return a higher accuracy for certain tasks but I've given you uh, sort of flexibility over accuracy, or I should say, I've given you flexibility in service of accuracy, especially accuracy that's based on your research question. Okay, uh, so we'll be getting to this in just a second. Uh, this is the this is a back off chain that I, I came up with for Greek, 
uh, that's working at a 94% uh, level. Uh, we start with a, a dictionary of high frequency forms, then we work on some training data, then we maybe have some customized, depending on what, what Greek we're lamentizing, regular expressions. Uh, I actually have it looking up some on a web service for the, the real difficult to find stuff. Uh, and then uh, I just apply an unknown so I know what the problems are. Uh, another advantage is familiarity of resources, okay? And um, you, have you seen something like that? You've seen paradigms for, for ancient languages perhaps, right? Um, we're used to thinking like this as philologists, as, and as, even as digital philologists, we, we learn Greek in a certain way and we tend to think about Greek in a certain way. Uh, what if I were to tell you that this is simply a regex pattern written in Greek form, right? I mean, I can just say that look for the beginning of a word and we can just look for those endings, right? We're already used to thinking in paradigms uh, and we want to retain, we don't want to throw out all of our philological training uh, because we're starting to use computers. What we want to do is start marrying those two worlds together, right? Uh, so regex and paradigm thinking, when we combine them, make the tool more useful, more flexible, again, better service of, of your work. We want to avoid or at least minimize black box thinking. And this is when you have these out-of-the-box lemmatizers that just do the task. When it doesn't work exactly the way you need it to for your research question, you have nowhere to go or you have limited options on where to go. Um, here, you can provide whatever training data helps with your problem. You can use the models I've given you in advance that might help you along the way, but you can also feed your own. You can use custom dictionaries. If you're doing a project I mean, what am I training uh, my Greek lemmatizer on? Homer, Plato, I mean, like stuff, you know, some New Testament stuff, uh, stuff that Perseus has been doing for years that we have available to us. If you're working on a, a Byzantine Greek project with, uh, you know, where almost all the words are gonna be out of vocabulary, but predictably out of vocabulary, we can build custom dictionaries. I can get you further along. How about if you're not working in Latin, you're not working in Greek, you're working on a language that's very poorly supported with digital uh, lexica or digital, um, uh, you don't have a lot of training data available, we can actually start building these tools up from the ground up slowly. Maybe you start with a small dictionary, but small dictionaries can be very effective. Uh, Ziff's Law, uh, if, if you know what's going on with that. In fact, the most frequently occurring words are going to help you get your limitization accuracy up pretty fast, okay? And we can start building models that maybe not are not the best ever, but you had nothing before. <laughs> so so we, we, can get, we can get further up the chain here. Uh, and without it being uh, somebody else's black box. Again, a reuse of related methods. I'm building these on existing uh, NLP tools, right? I am repurposing the Natural Language Toolkit's uh, tagger, POS tagger, to, to work on a lemmatization task, right? And this is, uh, this is a good thing because the, <laughs> the NLTK community has already supported this tagging and it's in, it's in use, it's robust, it works. Uh, we're now able to take advantage. We're not reinventing wheels. We're uh, uh, riding on the wheel. Uh, this bad metaphor to start, and I should have stopped earlier. And then the, re the reuse of existing tools is something I've been working on recently. There are tools that already are available for your language. So in, in Latin, there's tons of lemmatizers that are available. In Greek, there's not so many, but there are some. We don't want to ignore all that good work. We're a research community, and we build upon each other's work. So recently, I've spent quite a bit of time writing wrappers for uh, other lemmatizers that can then be added to a back off chain. And that's what you saw here. The lemmatizer 5 here is a Morpheus web server lemmatizer, right? Uh, Perseus has a web so a server to look up Greek forms. I don't want to ignore all the, you know, decades of good work, right? Uh, but I can do it in a way that it becomes one of the, it becomes one of the blocks in the lemmatizer. Okay? Uh, so I wrote this wrapper for, for Morpheus. Where is this going? I want to extend uh, the uh, lemmatization beyond Latin and Greek, especially for low resource languages, those are without training data in lexica. And because uh, of the flexibility in construction, uh, that is where uh, we can work together if you're working on a language that's not here uh, for uh, getting, getting from the ground up. Let's start building up those lexica slowly. Let's start building up the training data slowly, but in a way in which we can start testing that it works, okay? Uh, and then I'm also interested in, right now we have a binary model where uh, where you are in the back off chain, right, is yes, no. If it finds it early in the back off chain, it just stops. But in fact, the, the taggers that are lower down on the chain can provide useful information. So right now I'm building ensemble scorers 
So you, you may get a very, with, the, with some of the dictionary lemmatizers, you're gonna get 100%. Uh, again, sun, always a preposition, is always gonna map to sun. That's 100% uh, likelihood. Uh, probably not gonna get any more helpful information down the line, but maybe with a word that is ambiguous, we will get uh, useful information from a context tagger versus a dictionary. So we wanna maybe uh, have a best score, a, a combined score out of all of those. That would be what I would like to do. And then uh, in the interest of this group here, I know your summer has been spent working on standardization and customization in digital and collaborative classics research. Uh, there's two avenues of future work that I think uh, uh, we should be paying attention to in this realm and that we could all work together on. One is linked open lexical data. Uh, in writing the wrappers uh, for the lemmatizers that exist, one source of continual frustration is that the if you test them on their own data, you get very high accuracy scores, but they all have different outputs. Uh, so one lemmatizer may give you the, uh, the for verbs say, uh, may give you the first person uh, present, uh, the first person singular present active form, right? Uh, so that amo, but another uh, lemmatizer outputs amare. Uh, they're both right, uh, but now it's, it's hard to, to Put them together. Uh, we now we have to build crossovers. What would be great is if we had some sort of agreement uh, over uh, in the, the way the linked data communities come together in, so, in, in uh, you know doing uh, places uh, for disambiguation and time period and like in so many good ways. It'd be great if we could do lexical data next. And I know some uh, we have people like uh, Giuseppe at Leipzig or uh, Greta Franzini who are working on this, and, and I'm all on board. And I'd love for you all to be as well. And then, again, back to that object-oriented philology model I talked about earlier. Um, if we have abstract classes that are doing this, and then we can create language customizations that are subclasses of that, this to me is exactly what standardization and customization does well, right? I've given you uh, the abstract model of how a lemmatizer built from many sub-lemmatizers can work. We can now just start your languages folder and then that's where the customization goes. We have different endings that you might need to pay attention to. You have different dictionaries that uh, can, we can make use of, right? Um, I think object-oriented philology is an idea. Uh, will make it easier to build uniform and consistent tools for many languages, going back to that high-level goal of really a comparative, like a, a sincere digital comparative philological model that is useful. Uh, and will give productive results. I think that that is. So that is uh, where I'm at on back off limitization. Now, we've been now talking for roughly 30 minutes. Um, so I said I was gonna talk about ancient Greek, <laughs> Greek in the title, uh, yet I've uh, spent most of my time talking about other languages, but that's good because uh, I, I think it's important to understand uh, how the classical language toolkit is developing in general. Uh, so I, I'd like to do a code demonstration. I'll, I'll run through it fairly quickly. I uh, again, it seemed like more people were coders than not, so I, I think that we're going to be okay. Uh, but if you, if you don't have any experience with uh, uh, the code, it will move fast, but hopefully not. Uh, it won't be inscrutable. So uh, let me just change windows here. Uh oh, that's not good. Um, let's see. I was so close to get with no technical problems and a technical demonstration. So let's try to launch it from here again. Binder has the prettiest wheels. Uh, and any of you can bring this up. This is an installation free uh, example. All the code's gonna run on uh, binder servers. So if you want to try this out, it doesn't seem like a lot of people have laptops out, uh, it's fine. You wanna go home and just try these methods, uh, you're, you're all set, you can do it. And I also apologize that if, if some of the other slides were small, th these are gonna be even smaller, um, but we'll, we'll do with what we can. Okay, so first of all, uh, let's just uh, load up. We need, we need some sentences. I'm gonna start with an English example uh, because I apparently refuse to talk about ancient Greek in this. Uh, so, 
we have uh, sentences that are already available from uh, or English. Why is this not running? Okay. We have we have we can get three thousand nine hundred and fourteen sentences. There we go in English that we can play around with through the Natural Language Toolkit. Here are some of the examples. Uh, there, there are just all over the place on topic, right? Uh, and here, if we scroll down, uh, I can use that training. I can use that as training data. I know the NLTK already has the, the sentences tagged for, the, again, we're just doing part of speech at this point. Uh, if I put hello world into it, just with uh, Unigram context, right? Uh, from the training data, it apparently knows that world is a noun, uh, but hello apparently doesn't appear in the training data. That's really interesting. Uh, but uh, that's that's how Unigram context works. It's, it's, it looks up what's the most frequently occurring tag that is with any a single word in, in the sentences you provided. Okay, and so if we have a sample sentence like uh, at Tokyo, the Nikkei index, uh, et cetera. We know what the tags are supposed to be. We can then evaluate accuracy on that. Uh, this, just the Unigram tagger alone starts us at an 85%, right? So this is just using the one bit of information for any given word in the training data is actually a pretty good start on moving the, the, this forward. We can also do things like provide, this is the dictionary style, right? So I can say, you can see here that um, Nikkei wasn't in the training data, so it didn't find anything. I can, I can tell the system that Nikkei is uh, a proper noun. I can say that selected, which it also didn't find, is a past tense verb, okay, a participle. Again, running that, we're gonna see, with just that dictionary, two words, we're at one tenth, one hundredth of a percent accuracy, but that's okay, because we're only tagging those two words, right? Now. This is good. Uh, you can see that that uh, gives us, when we combine them, now we put them in order together, First, we have the Unigram tagger. We tell it to back off to this tagger, which is the default tagger. All right. Uh, just, just giving it that information, we can boost accuracy just a little bit. Uh, we can give it regular expression patterns. If it ends with, uh, if it's a number, we can give it a number tag. If it's a word that ends in ed, it, maybe it's a, a past tense verb, right? We can give it those sorts of patterns. Just with those two patterns, we can get 5.36% actually, which is kind of crazy actually. Uh, it those must be very heavy, heavy number sentences. And then again here, uh, we put, the, put everything in the chain together. We have it go to the dictionary tagger, to the train tagger, to the default, put it all together. And in English, we see, we can get up to 85% is not so bad. So, we can apply all of those same things. That's the code that explains what I said in theory in the talk, right? Just to give you a review. Uh, now we're, we can do the same thing with lemmatization. We have a sentence like this sentence from the beginning of Lysias 1, Peri, Polu, on, et cetera, right? Uh, for example, we can just make it uh, a default lemmatizer which tags everything with unknown. That's uh, a interesting way of approaching the problem, of course. Uh, anyone want to guess what the accuracy is for that? It's it's zero. Okay, wait, wait. It's, 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 none, none of them are actually unknown. Okay. Uh, but then we also have training data available to ourselves. We have, uh, again, I went to the Perseus, uh, th those ancient Greek and Latin tree banks, just extracted all of the forms and all of the lemmas. Now I have something that looks quite a bit like the sentences that are available from the NLTK, right? And we can train on that, again, using, say, uh, Unigram context, just the one word information, counting which happens to appear more frequently. See, this is what I got out of, this is the train data I'll use, Entha matches to Entha, De to De, Poli to Polus, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these are some sentences that uh, appear, uh, or is the guy telling it, you know, uh, these are things that Perseus has already done that work. And we should we should thank, by the way, not just Perseus, uh, though they deserve extra, they've been doing it for decades, giving us good open source, open access uh, development. It's, it's extremely helpful to the community. 
But uh, I work, uh, uh, I stand on the, the shoulders of tagging giants. I have lots of data available to me because of the people who came before me. So it's, it's always good to acknowledge that work. Uh, again, using that Perseus data, I can just train uh, for unigram context. And we find out that with just uh, the form lemma information, again, using that AMO AMOR technique of which one appears the most often when there's an ambiguous form, we start off at a pretty good place at 88.2%. Okay, so I'm at 40 minutes. Do I have five more minutes? Okay. I want to rush, but I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, leave you behind here. Uh, we can do the same thing uh, as we were doing in the tagging models. But instead of applying a POS tag, we can say, "All right, uh, menti oentis uh, is going to map to menti oes, and narthexi is going to map to narthex." Right. Um, this would be very strange to have come up with that randomly on your own, but we know um, here Narthecki wasn't in the training data, right? Uh, I guess there were in a lot of capsules in the training data. Um, so that's a none. We can correct for that. Whoops. All right, by adding it to the dictionary, we'll see that now it knows that when it sees the form Narthex, it should Narthex. Now, again, maybe if you have a very specific set of, uh, um, if your research question is asking things on a specific domain, a specific corpus, you can build up a custom dictionary like this. What will be much more effective in what I'm working on on a daily basis is making the sort of large scale, like thousands and thousands, thousand word uh, lexica that can support the whatever I saw, it was like 33,000 sentences of training data. Um, you, but you could make a small one that apply, like maybe, there's, maybe there's a person, this would be an example, you're, you're working on something that's fairly good attic reek, whatever, however you want to define that, but it's referring to a specific person over and over again. And that person doesn't appear in the training data. You can build a, just, a, 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 just a dictionary of that person's, the, the forms of that person's name. It would be a perfectly good example uh, of course, of course, if you run uh, uh, the uh, this small dictionary uh, uh, lemmatizer on all of the sentences, uh, it, it has a zero percent accuracy as well because it, that word does not appear very many times. And this is that paradigm thinking. Uh, here, we can create a, re a regular expression lemmatizer uh, that says, well, anytime we have a word that ends with uh, an omicron, okay, uh, and then it's followed by ace or entos, enti, enta and then ends the word, this is the way regular expressions work, we can replace the, uh, we can have it go O, and then it's going to resolve to ace. These are actually fairly predictable. We can, I spend uh, quite a bit of time, I build up the, uh, the, the paradigms for Latin, and I'm, right now I'm writing the paradigms for Greek. Uh, these are actually pretty effective for getting out of uh, vocabulary uh, words limitized. Um, and actually, in other lemmatizer study that has been done, there's been actually quite a bit of attention paid to, uh, say, machine learning. Uh, machine learning can figure out word endings and combinations pretty well, uh, and that's great. And I don't want that work to to go by the by the wayside. Uh, but I would argue that that's not a philological way of approaching the problem. And by not being philological, it winds up being it can be obscure to the people who are the audience for the product, right? So uh, this is, a, regular expressions are sort of in the middle. They're sort of their own obscure ancient language <laughs> anyway, uh, but it is a way of thinking about paradigms in a way that is actually machine actionable. So we can, we can do good work there. Here uh, is an example, how, putting together all those into a Greek, this is how I think about the Greek lemmatizer, right? Um, I make the base lemmatizer, there's a unigram lemmatizer that is on uh, uh, some high frequency Greek words, if it finds it there, great, it, it tags them. If it doesn't, it goes to Lemmatizer 2, where we go to those training sentences. We use that frequency distribution, but some words don't appear in the training data. If it doesn't find it, it says no. It says, well, is it either uh, Mentioentis or uh, Narthecki? Uh, it doesn't find that there. It will try the regular expressions we gave it. If it doesn't find it there, it marks it as unknown. OK, and that one, uh, we're, uh, oh, we lost accuracy somewhere along the way. That's Oh, yes, I see why. Uh, this, this goes back to that problem of uniform resources, right? This is uh, not a word. This is not exactly linked to open lexical data, but it's the same problem, and it's a good illustration. This period in the training data is tagged as P-U-N-C for punctuation. 
but I have a lemmatizer that's written to map punctuation to itself. So all of those are failing. So we lost 10% accuracy just on poorly uh, lemmatized punctuation. I can normalize for that. Uh, just take all the punctuation, make it itself. If I run that again, you'll see uh, that we're back in the, that range we want, 87.71%, having done uh, not that much regular expression or lexical work. So it's very nice. That training data is really great to have. Uh, but uh, that period punctuation example should be a good example of why we have to be careful with the garbage in, garbage out problem, okay? Or, or, or watching out for, we, you know your data, right? You wanna know what you're feeding into any system and know what's happening at the end of it. Transformations are important. Uh, here, you can look at this code later. Um, uh, this is an example of how we can take uh, an existing lemmatizer like the Morpheus web surface and make it uh, wrap it for, uh, you know, so it can be used in the back off tagger. Uh, it's quite a bit of code and we don't need to look at that. But then again, once you build something new, you can put it in, in, the, in the chain wherever you would like, wherever you think it will be most useful. And now we have another lemmatizer uh, I'm not going to evaluate that uh, because it will send thousands and thousands of requests to the Perseus servers that I'd rather not uh, do to them today. Um, yeah, so I've I've commented out that. Um, but uh, whoops, run that. Okay. All right, and so just as a, by way of just to conclude real fast. Uh, I thought it might be helpful to run over just a couple more Greek sentences and then I'll stop talking. I have a sentence from Iliad 24, first sentence, uh, a sentence uh, from the beginning of Plato's Republic, and then a sentence from uh, the Gospel of Mark. So three different domains of Greek. Greek, um, who studied ancient Greek uh, in, at, at the, I mean, it's kind of crazy that uh, we call Homer and Lucian the same. Right. Um, I mean, it was, we know they're different, uh, and we know the forms are different, uh, yet we tend to think of them as the same discipline. So again, this is another argument for why we may want to be able to have that flexibility in uh, tool design, where, if you, look, if you're working on a Homeric problem, maybe we should only be training on Homeric data. Uh, maybe we're working on, uh, you know, the second sophistic. Maybe we want to use, uh, I, <laughs> there's all sorts of reasons why that might actually be a difficult problem. Uh, maybe we want to train it on uh, uh, the fifth, fifth century. Uh, but okay, so Iliad 24, uh, let's, let's see what kind of thing we get, when, what kind of output we get from that last lemmatizer chain, right? That's the full stack that I gave you there. Uh, it looks like it did a pretty good job. Uh, but again, you have to know your data. The reason it did a good job is because Iliad 24 is in our training data. Okay, so you want to be careful <laughs> that you're not, uh, you know, that's really overfitting your model here. Uh, it's totally overdetermined, uh, but it, I just wanted to show that as an example of kind of how not to do this. The Republic is a, a kind of a different case. The Republic is not in our training data. Uh, in fact, only in the in those Perseus sentences, I want to say only the Euthyphro uh, of Plato is there. Uh, using our lemmatizer stack for that, it actually does a pretty good job, right? Uh, I was actually kind of surprised that the, the Piraeus appears somewhere in, in our training data, which is nice. But it didn't find everything. Remember, I put a default tagger at the bottom of that chain uh, for unknown, so it's easy to spot. Uh, Glauconos didn't show anything. Uh, is that the only one? Right. And this might be, uh, this is what I was talking about before. Uh, well, actually, let's, let's just look at Mark first, and then uh, I'll, I'll go back to that point. Here, if we do the section of Mark here, it didn't find a one name. Okay, another, another person name. Uh, Galilean, okay, we can understand why that Galilee might not appear in uh, classical training data. Um, anything else here? Uh, oh, this is actually, uh, uh, any can is a, is a biblical specific form. Um, again, you got to know your domain, what you're asking. This is the perfect example of how once you get to know your data, the flexibility becomes uh, fairly useful. For that Plato problem, uh, maybe uh, maybe I really do need to have a regular expression in that regular expressions pattern that has own with os, e, and a. That's, that's actually a pretty commonly occurring pattern. Uh, it's worth adding. I'll, I'm, that's going to wind up in my like master uh, list of Greek reg regex patterns. Uh, if I add that, we'll see now. 
Glaucon is correctly lemmatized. We have that's we, we have flexibility with our problem. Actually, uh, I think that the the um, this should say New Testament here. Uh, the uh, Anakin problem is more interesting because now we're really maybe if you're doing biblical work, you should be training on biblical data or church fathers or something like that. But we can always add uh, Anakin uh, and Kitso to that list here. And again, we know our data. We know what we can do with it. We can lemmatize it again and Right, it should appear because we told it to appear. Uh, but you have this flexibility, depending on what your research question is, to build the tools that match what the work you need to do needs to accomplish. Okay, and I'll leave it there. Actually, I'll evaluate. I won't send three thousand requests to Perseus right now, but I'll send uh, a couple hundred. Uh, that this that the lemmatizer that includes that full chain, including the Morpheus web service, is is, is pretty good. Uh, well, let's run in the background. It might take a second on these servers. Um, but by while that runs in the background, I will sign off and say thank you for listening to a talk about lemmatization and back off chains and ancient Greek and the classical language toolkit on the hottest day of the year. I appreciate it. Thank you so much to uh, Gabby and uh, Valeria and Simona for having me. Uh, I will stop talking now. And I hope you have some questions about the work I do or the work we all could do together. So thank you very much. Oh. That, that was so good. You clapped just as 94.8%. I, I, I want, that's a good number, so thank you. All right, so uh, we have a, Okay, uh, and to all of you, if you're watching out there, thank you again for tuning in, uh, and have a wonderful day. It's on which tab? Stop. That's the screen share, and then you stop the broadcast. Signing out.